Welcome to Orange Coast Community Church on this wonderful, glorious Good Friday. There wouldn't be an Easter if there wasn't a Good Friday. And I woke up this morning thanking God. And I took it personal. He went to the cross because of all of my sins. And, um, and we all have ownership of that. And we need to come tonight with a new mindset, with a new heart. He's looking for people to use, and he wants to use us. He wants to use Orange Coast Community Church. So please stand with us now as we're going to worship our Heavenly Father and our Lord and our Savior, our Jesus Christ.
Amen. 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 Amen.
Lord, we love you. You are the happy God. We worship you. for coming tonight makes us happy makes Jesus happy 
Well, the pastors and elders are all going to be reading certain sections of scripture tonight. And mine is John 18, 28 to 32. Okay, Lord, again, we've sung your praises. We just ask, Lord, and we know your presence is here. Um, touch us all where that place is tonight that we need to hear from you. And uh, thank you for that truth. That's the God you are. Pastor, when he's taught about studying Bibles and when you need to put messages together, he says, in our Bible studies, always look out for key words and phrases. And all of what I was seeing and studying this, and when we get to John real quick, we're going to look first at some of the reasons or the reasons that they call Bible prophecy Bible prophecy. Because Isaiah wrote his book about 2,700 years ago. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 53, verse 7, Isaiah 53, verse 7. It's going to speak to some of the things that we're going to see as some of the pastors and elders go through the verses that they are speaking on. Amen. Isaiah 53, verse 7. And he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Speaking of Jesus, 2,700 years ago. Yes, he opened not his mouth. And he was L-E-D, led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. And as some of the elders and pastors will be teaching tonight, we wonder, well, why didn't he just speak up? Because the prophecy 2,700 years ago said he would be silent as a lamb before the shearers. The only person and the only time he spoke under oath is when they asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the son of God? And then he had an answer correctly. He was silent before everyone else who asked him any questions. Why? Because that's what was needed to do to fulfill the prophecy. And going back to, to John now, remember that, okay, that he was silent before everybody. The most innocent person who ever walked never claimed his own defense. Think about that. John 28, verse 28. And before we start real quick, we're going to talk about Pilate. Everybody tonight will be talking about Pilate, the priests, the people. What you have to understand when it came to these are bit players, friends. The star of this whole thing is Christ himself. All these other people were plugged in places so that all the things that Christ came to do would take place. Pilate had to be there. The high priest had to be there. The people who rejected him had to be there for a simple reason is because they were said in Scripture they were going to be there. Amen? So it says in verse 28, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not want to go into the praetorium, lest they should become defiled, that they should be defiled before they might eat Passover. Okay? So whether they were the praetorium was Herod's castle or if it was the Antonius Tower, they don't know for sure which one it was. Either one, he was still a prisoner, correct? So it says early morning, probably sometimes after 6 o'clock, because the Romans like to get done early by 11 or 12 so they could go out and torture people or do whatever they were going to do. Okay, let's get an early start. It was early that they might not defile themselves by entering in somewhere where a Gentile lived. They were railroading the Son of God. They were lying and doing everything they could to get Jesus in front of somebody who would crucify him. But we're going to see in a few verses, they had to get the Romans to do it because Scripture said he had to be lifted up before men. And when the Jews had a chance before the Romans took the power away to do capital punishment, they stoned their people to death, which would have not have been a fulfilling of what Scripture says. 
And, you can, and we'll get to that. In John, he, three, four different verses, John, he says, I have to be lifted up. Verse 29, Pilate then went out and said to them, what accusation do you bring against this man? So even as flaky as Pilate was, vacillating, weak, and all those things, at this point, being the judge and being in charge of things, he went out and did what his job was to find out what was going on with them and Jesus and how it was going to affect and why it would affect him. So what, what is the accusation that you have to bring? What is the charge against this man? Earlier on, if you read the Gospels, he was charged with what? Blasphemy. Because when he answered the question truthfully, are you the son of man, son of God? He goes, it is as you say. Right? But then it had a change because Rome wasn't going to charge Jesus on any form that came from the Jewish people because they didn't mix, as we're going to see. So he goes, what did he do? So what they did somewhere between those trials was got to somebody and said, it isn't any more blasphemy, it's sedition. He says, he doesn't pay taxes. He doesn't say that anything is deserving to Caesar. Is that what he says? No. No. He said he's claiming to be a king, which he did and which he was, and neither. So everything they came about now went from blasphemy to sedition. Now it's not against the Jew and the high priest. It's against Rome. We have to get Rome involved. So then they answered him, if he were not an evildoer, right? Remember, he's asking for an accusation. What did he do? If he weren't an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you, which is saying we're not going to have a trial. We don't want a trial. You just have to believe what we said. We need, it. We need him killed. Courts don't work like that, even <laughs> kangaroo courts. You at least get to you know, speak. And it's interesting. Why didn't Jesus speak even through all the accusations and all the lies and falsehood, right? Because today, even as then, right, if you get disruled in court, what happens? They throw you out. You can't sit, you, even today, you can't sit there and yell at the judge, not for very long. And there, are, there were times in America and in countries today where slaves and servants are not allowed to speak back even in their own defense. Mark chapter 10 says, about 46, chapter verse 46, that Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to do what? To serve. And what? Become a servant for the many. The servant knew he could not speak back. Not just because of who he was, but because of what has already been set in place. Do you think he knew Isaiah's prophecy? He sure did. He sure did. So they said, you take him. He's now here's what he says. You take him and you judge him according to your own law. Could they do that? No. Why? Their own law would not allow them to crucify Jesus. First, they didn't have the power to. Because he said, Josephus said in about A.D. 6, when Rome took over Judea, he took away the power for them to execute capital punishment. So they had one strike against them, and the second one was they do not crucify by lifting up. They crucified by stoning, Stephen being the perfect example. You take him and you judge him, which they didn't want to hear. And the Jews there told him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Can't do it. You have to do it, Pilate. The Romans have to do it. So in verse 32, in saying of Jesus, and it might be fulfilled, he said, saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by which death it would be. So if you want to turn real quick to John 3, I'm sorry, if somebody wants to get to John 3.14, John 3.14, they just read it out loud. And John, somebody with 8.28, still in John. And John 12.32 and 33. And whoever has it, read it. Is 
just as it was raised up in the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? They rebelled. Snakes came, bit them. They were all dying from poisoning. What happened? He said, look to the serpent on the pole. And what? Be right. And be cured. Okay. Go ahead. If someone has John 3.13. All right, that's um, and then the other one would be. Would anyone have that one? John twelve thirty two thirty three. So Jesus knew everybody else wanted another way. He is the star of, this, of the show then, the star of his show today. And everybody else are, are stand-ins and second, what is it called, fiddles and all those things. They played their part. They did what God had them to do. And Jesus did exactly what the Father had them to do. Amen. That's okay. I got another take on it. Um, good evening, beloved. My assignment for this evening is John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. And we'll pick it up there. Therefore, Pilate entered the praetorium again and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews? This is not a rhetorical question. Jesus had been arrested for blasphemy, charging him or charging him with being the son of God. But that charge was not going to carry any weight with the Romans. So when the temple guards delivered Jesus to Pilate, they changed the charges so that he was a king, a rebel, an insurrectionist, making him a threat to Rome. Verse 34, Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Jesus, being a good lawyer, answered a question with a question. <laughs> but the real question is Jesus wants to know who these others are. Who are his, who are his confidential informants? Remember, to bring charges against a defendant, you have to have two or more witnesses. So Jesus wants to know who the others are. At this particular time, it is only Pilate and Jesus in the praetorium. The others don't want to get defiled. They cannot enter the praetorium without defiling themselves. Now, Jesus and the apostles, they did their Passover dinner on Monday, Thursday which would, be, would have been Thursday night. The high priest, the Pharisees, um, the Sadducees, uh, the Sanhedrin, they were all going to do the Passover dinner or the Seder dinner later on Friday, okay? Why would it take, why would they do it at different times? Because over 200,000 sheep were going to be sacrificed on a 24-hour period, okay? And so that's where you see the difference of when the dinners are going to take place. And that's why they don't want to enter the praetorium and defile themselves because they have yet to have the Passover dinner. Jesus and the apostles have already finished the dinner. Hence, he got arrested. This is all illegal. Everything the Jews are doing is totally illegal, okay? Um, and this, this happens to be in the morning now when Jesus is taken to the praetorium and dropped off to Pilate. And this is when they changed the charges from blasphemy to calling him a king. Verse 35. 
Pilate, er, Pilate answered, Am I not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, chief priest, handed you over to me. What have you done? Okay. Just like we have the Fifth Amendment, the Jews have a Fifth Amendment, and the Romans have a Fifth Amendment, it is not legal for the prosecution to ask an incriminating question. But it is only Pilate and Jesus in the room, and Pilate is done. He's had it. He wants to go back to bed. All he wants Jesus is to do is say he's not guilty, and he's going to send him on his way, and he's going back to bed. He's getting under the covers. Pilate's not so lucky. Jesus, an or verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servant would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Christians have made this one the most recognized verse, one of the most recognized verses in the Bibles. We discussed this at the elders meeting last Sunday. Um, and, and I think you'll, you'll all agree that um, we have seen this icon, not of this world, plastered everywhere. The initials N, little O, big T for a cross and a W. I recall for almost 20 years seeing it plastered on everything. And uh, it, it's funny because we were talking about it in uh, our meeting, and we hardly see it anymore. And we were thinking, wow, is this a sign that the great apostasy has come? Maybe so, maybe not. No man knows the time or the hour. And so we can't necessarily say that. And we have seen revel uh, revivals breaking out. And so it's possibly not true, but it's it's just kind of strange that all of a sudden this icon that was plastered on everything, I mean, surfboards, skateboards, semi-trucks, uh, lock car windows, and, and just everything imaginable, t-shirts, hats, tennis shoes. It, I mean, it was crazy. It was everywhere. And now I just don't see it anymore. Makes you go, hmm. I regress. <laughs> Anyway, we're still standing, and that's all that matters. Jesus continues, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as my kingdom is not of this realm, this is great news. If this is, if this is all there is, Jesus would ask the Father to send his angels and to save him. But this is not all there is. The best is yet to come, and we might call that paradise. Verse 37, therefore, Pilate said to them, so you are a king. Another incriminating question, but Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king, and for this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. What was the purpose to which Jesus has come to the earth? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have salvation but he's not just salvation he is the way to salvation he is the way the truth and the life if you want to get to the father you must go through the son he is our justification he is our sanctification and he will be our glorification amen Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, this is a cynical question, but it's not a rhetorical question. 
because you have to understand the Romans and the Greeks combined probably had close to a thousand different definitions for truth. But the fact of the matter is when you when you take the word of God and you take the deeds and you put them together, you have truth. The word put on flesh came to the earth and tabernacled with us. Word and deed, truth. And that's what truth is. And after saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no ground at all for the charges in his case. With that, I'll turn it over to Elder Rick. spot here. <laughs> okay, my verses tonight are verses John 18, 39 through 19, 3. And then I'm going to read uh, Renee's verses four through six of chapter 19 because Renee is sick tonight and cannot be with us. And so I'm just going to very quickly cover um, Renee's portion. Okay. And we'll, we'll, I'll read to you um, the, the starting passages here all through, all the way through 19 six. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews. So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. <laughs> Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail! king of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priest and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Now we're going to go back to chapter 18, verse, uh, and we'll start with verse 39. It says, but you have a custom that I release someone. In my research, I found a lot of commentators that say that there is no historical background or historical uh, record of this custom. Now, <laughs> that's a simple truth for me, okay? This passage was written by the Apostle John. And what's an apostle? He's someone that saw it live. He's an eyewitness. Okay? But there's two eyewitnesses in this case. There's the Holy Spirit. He saw the whole thing. Who wrote the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So what do you do in a case like this? 
you believe the word of God first and not the commentators. This is why we study the Bible day in, day out, every single Sunday, is so that we will know what the word of God says. You pay attention. You learn what it says. That way you'll know what the truth is. So when you read this, you know it says it right here. You have a custom that I release someone, okay? And they and the, it did exist. Now, there's a couple of uh, commentators that wrote, well, the Jews had another, another custom where uh, two people were released. One, um, that to go out and Satan would kill him. And two, um, he would be crucified in the sense uh, as an offering for sin or whatever. Uh, you know, I don't like changing the scripture. I don't like going with that. You know, I'm just giving you that example as to why you need to study the scripture. Because when you read something like that, you're going to know. There's no, no question about that. Okay. That I release for you the king of the Jews. So they cried out saying, not this man, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas is an interesting fellow. Okay, an insurrectionist, uh, a liar, a thief, a robber, a murderer, every, you know, thing that you would need to be to be an insurrectionist, you know, to lead an uprising against Rome. Okay, um, not my kind of guy, you know, and so... Um, There's not that much to say about Barabbas, you know. Um, it just shows that, that when sin takes over, in a sense, that sin reigned the whole day. And, it, and sin, ha haven't you ever felt like when you're down on yourself that you're being picked on and you're picking out the worst possible things in your life and you're hammering yourself about them? Well, it's kind of this thing here. You know, they pay, uh, the worst possible man on earth was going to be released. Okay, but it had to be. Okay. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. Well, Pilate had to take Jesus back into the praetorium and scourge him. And under Roman law, Pilate had to be present at that scourging. And scourging in a case like this would be 39 lashes. 40 was was deemed to kill a man. So they stopped at 39 so that they would be able to deliver Jesus alive. Okay. Now, G. Campbell Morgan used a word that I absolutely love. He said, Pilate did the most dastardly thing of all of all time you know wicked is another trend, you know way to put it it's just so evil you know that it, but the thing is what happened here the reason why he did that is he took him back in and the other uh, G Campbell Morgan says also he didn't want to kill him okay but he wanted to bring him back out again beaten so you could see the bloody Christ with the crown of thorns, you know, and the purple robe and everything all wrapped around him, you know. Um, and so he, he thought, well, maybe the crowd at this point would, would um, uh, you know, go, okay, you know, and let him go. But no, you got the worst of it again. So Pilate then scorched him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. Now, the crown of thorns is interesting, very interesting, because they wove it out of something that grew around Jerusalem, that well, some thorny bush or something, and there was three or four names of it, but I'm not good at scientific names. I just can't get them. But anyway... So, they didn't just place it on Jesus' head. They smashed it on his head. 
okay? So that those thorns would dig in and, you know, have you ever gotten scratched by a thorny rose bush or something like that? What happens to your arm or something when that happens? They swell up. In our backyard, down at our house, we have a lime tree. And the stickers are about this long. They're about two inches long. And one day I'm in the backyard trying to harvest a few little limes. Cindy needed some. And uh, I stuck my arm in there and it scratched. And man, it just welted up. So one of the most humiliating things that Jesus had to suffer was that crown. Because on the cross, can you imagine those th- because those little poisonous things sticking into his head and his head swelling up and just, be, you know, just mi- just misery. Anything that they could do to him to cause misery, they did. So <laughs> they put it on his head. They put the purple robe on him. The robe signifies the thing of a king. They tried to, this, to mocking him. This is a king, okay? He's your king. Here's his purple robe. So they put that on him. Okay, And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and give him slaps in the face. Now, I've been in a few fights in my life, fist fights, and with a, with a closed fist, you know, you get a bump on, the, bump on the, you get a bruise, a black eye, or something like that, but a slap hurts worse than anything else. Now, I was thinking about this verse, and I'm thinking that, okay, maybe, maybe when you think back to Palm Sunday and the stories that I've seen and and heard, you know, that the runners, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And the runners were running toward Jerusalem. The king is coming. He's raised the dead and entering into the city, you know, and and that's, you know, the, the joyous you know, the palms and everything else when he came riding in on the donkey that, the, that, that these guys ran ahead forewarning the city of Jerusalem to be ready, okay? Well, they also heard of the things that Jesus had done in the past and said, like on, in the Sermon on the Mount and other places, you know, where if, if a man slaps you on the right cheek, offer him the left. And I'm wondering to myself, were they mocking Jesus by something he said by with the slap? Was that to see what his reaction would be according to what he had taught? Okay, it was just a thought. Okay, there, there's nothing there other than that. Okay, he, Okay, so Pilate Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Now, Pilate was a judge, okay, an official judge. And he read the verdict, not guilty, okay? So when the chief, um, we was wearing the crown, the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said, behold the man. And he stood him there and Jesus was bleeding and, and, and you could see, you could see the effects of the scourging that he had just gone through. The blood on the face, the crown of thorns, bleeding, his, you know, I mean, just beaten. So when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him for I find no guilt in him. Well, part of the thing that that Campbell Morgan, G. Campbell Morgan had said in there was that Pilate was trying to pacify and play both sides of the coin. Okay that he was trying to pacify the, the chief priests and, and the officers, you know, of the Sanhedrin and whatever, that, you know, here you have the man and 
What am I going to do with him? I really, I find him not guilty. It's up to you now. What are you going to do? And so Pilate then says, take him yourselves and crucify him. So that's the end of mine. And I covered a little bit of what Renee was supposed to cover there on verses 4 through 6. But um, uh, to me, this was a very interesting study because there were tears, you know, that when I pictured Jesus standing there with that crown of thorns and that robe, I just, you know, I, I go, he did that for me. He did that for all of us here, you know. And so we must think that, you know, and thank him this Easter that we've got, now we can rejoice, you know. Good evening again. Two years ago, I was up here on the stage, and we talked about Jesus' statement, Eloi, Eloi, lam sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you remember, we came to the conclusion that Jesus said that, so we never have to. Last year, I was up here, and we were talking a little bit about the centurion and what was going on at the cross at the time and um, the, the earthquakes, and the, what was happening in the veil in the temple. And we were looking really deep into this centurion. Does anybody remember what the centurion's name was? It was Petronius. Petronius was his name. This year, my reading is from John 19, 7 through 12. But as Pastor Rick has always taught us, Context, context, context. Verse 6 says, Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was even more afraid. Verse 9, and when he went back inside the palace, he said to Jesus, where do you come from? But Jesus didn't even answer him. Pilate then in verse 10 says, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered then, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. Therefore, the ones who handed me over to you have the greater sin. Verse 12, and from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders cried out, If you let this man go, you are not a friend of Caesar. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against and opposes Caesar. Orange Coast Community Church and everybody that's watching online, today we're going to court. We're going to court, and you are going to have to make a verdict. So get ready. Just like, you know, you see on TV and all the court hearings, the prosecution always goes first. There are six serious accusations being made against Jesus by the prosecution team. Prosecution team. Threatened to destroy the temple, Matthew 26, 61. And said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Acquisition. Accusation. Jesus was accused of being a malefactor, an evildoer. John 18, 30. They answered and said to him, if this man were not criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. The third charge, being charged with perverting the nation. Luke 23, 2, 
And they began to bring charges against him, saying, We have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar in saying that he himself is Christ, a king. <coughs> again, he's being charged with forbidding people to pay their taxes. Right there is Luke again, 23.2. Being charged with making himself a king, Luke 23.2. Number six charge being charged was stirring up strife. Luke 23, 5. But they kept on insisting, saying, he is stirring up the people, teaching over Judea, starting from Galilee as far as this place. But there was a seventh charge that was looming. And it came out. The seventh charge was that Jesus claimed to be the unique Son of God. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So with any court case, we heard from the prosecution. Let's see what the defense team has to say. Let's take a look at the defense team. So we're going to call to stand the first witness, God the Father. Okay? Here we go. Buckle it up. What does God the Father say? Matthew 3, 16, 17. After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him, and behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's a pretty powerful witness right there. At the Mount of Transfiguration is another time that God said who he is. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Next person we're going to call to the stand, Jesus himself. Jesus says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Jesus says in John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, I have been with you for so long a time that you have not come to know me, Philip. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say to me, show me the Father? The next witness for the prosecution or for the defense team is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in John 15, 26 says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, namely the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify about me. Are there any other witnesses that we can call for the defense? You bet. How about the angels? The angels in Luke 1, 31, 32, and 35. Gabriel's talking to Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son. And you shall call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, also, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. What about the angels? Again, they talking to the shepherds. Don't forget that. And so the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good news and great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A 
Are there any, any, anybody else that uh, we can call to the phone? You bet. How about the demons? The demons they themselves cry out in Matthew 8, 29. And they cried out saying, what business do you have with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment, torment us before the time? Matthew 8, 29. Demons again. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. <laughs> Lastly, we're told in Scripture that the wounds testify for Jesus. What they did for his body. Jesus said in Luke 11.23 and in Matthew 12.30, either you are for me or you're against me. So each and every one of us here in this room and on TV and my family back east and my friends up north, today you are called to make a verdict. What is your decision? And then uh, aim it towards the outline or aim it towards the animal she'd be shooting. Then he took her out to the woods and put her up in a tree. He said, I'll be 100 yards away. If you see a deer, you fire off two shots. When I hear the gun, I'll come out to help. Well, no sooner had she reached the spot and he reached his spot when he heard the gun go off. Bam. And then there was a second thought. Bam. Wow, that was fast, he thought. She must have got lucky. Then he heard a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth shot. So he ran over, only to find a cowboy standing with both hands in the air, saying, okay, lady, okay. You can have the deer. Just let me get my saddle off of it. <laughs> well, give her an A for effort. But she blew it big time, just like Pontius Pilate. Now, we have seen in the passages that our elders have read that he stated three times, John 18 and 19, I find no guilt. I find no guilt. I find no guilt in this man. So initially, he tries to support the Savior, but then he blows it big time by refusing to release the man whom he declared is not guilty. Throughout the whole sad scenario, Pilate has sidestepped his responsibility to govern Judea wisely. He knew that Jesus was innocent, but he could not convince the Jewish high priest, Caiaphas, and his clan, or the bloodthirsty crowd. Everyone wanted Jesus dead. Pilate tries one ploy after another. In verses 13 to 14 in your outline, he offers the declaration. Note verse 13 of John 19. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, a few years ago, archaeologists actually excavated this stone pavement. It's right near the Tower of Antonia. And today, you could actually stand on the place where Jesus and Pilate once stood. Verse 14. It was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. Pilate does not want to put Christ on a cross. He wants to offer him to Israel as a king. 
and he's doing everything in his authority and power to push the prince of peace, even as our elders said, back out of his hands so he could go to bed and into the hands of the Hebrews. He has pronounced him innocent of any crime. Chapter 18, 38. He tried to pardon him at the Passover. Chapter 18, 39. He tried to placate the priests and the people with the punishment of painful scourging. Chapter 19, 15. He tries to plead with the crowd. He tries one trick after another after another. But in the end, Pilate blunders. He blows it big time. He makes a major mess. Talk about cleanup on aisle five. A truck in Memphis, Tennessee hit a retaining wall and crashed, spilling a huge load of Bertoli Alfredo sauce all over the place. The road was closed as workers struggled to clean up the sticky, high calorie sauce and thousands and thousands of pieces of broken shards of glass. Like that truck driver, we all make messes in life. Remember the time you dropped the pizza upside down, landing right with the food on the floor? Or how about the time the garbage broke before you got it out the door and into the bin? Or how about that one time when something came out of your mouth that you wished you could have quickly taken back? We all spill the sauce. That's why Jesus could not avoid the cross. Even was stated by our first speaker tonight, there were all ploys in this plan. Everyone had to play their part. Christ could not avoid Calvary. He went to pay for all crimes, including Pilate's crime of sidestepping his responsibility. And the declaration led to, number two, the denouncement, verse 15. So they cried out. Away with them! Away with them! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. You bold-faced, disgusting Jewish liars. You know that's a lie. Everyone knew that was a lie. They had declared privately they had declared publicly caesar was not their king only god was their king and so they toss out a bold faced lie they're lying through their teeth well the judge tells the defendant you are charged with attacking your boss with a hammer you jerk shouts a guy from the back of the courtroom the judge said, you're also charged with attacking a bartender with your hammer. Jerk, shouts the man. And the judge bangs his gavel down and says, sir, one more outburst from you. There's going to be a contempt of court. The man said, I'm sorry, your honor, but I have been this jerk's neighbor for 10 years. And every time I've asked to borrow his hammer, he said he didn't have one. <laughs> He's lying about the hammer. They're lying about their relationship to Caesar. The leaders of Israel would never see Caesar as their king, but they are willing to lie in order to get Jesus to die. As was stated tonight, this whole trial was filled with illegalities. The denouncement gave birth to the denial. And to see that, You'll want to backpedal to the first gospel, that's Matthew 27 and verse 28. Matthew 27 and verse 24, I believe it is. Twenty-seven, twenty-four. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting. He took water. He washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. 
Oh, if only that were true. Pilate knew exactly what was right to do. He is given into hesitation, anxiety, and fear. He was aroused by the presence of Christ, but he was reluctant to conform to the truth presented to him. So what does Pilate do? He attempts to wash away a crime that he has personally committed. He's a perfect picture of Shakespeare's corrupt character, Lady Macbeth. In the aftermath of the murder that she herself orchestrates, you see her standing next to a wash basin, scrubbing for all she's worth, trying to remove the incriminating blood from her garment as she shouts, out, damn spot, out, out. That's the picture of Pilate. Like Lady Macbeth, he had hands that could never come clean. He could have had his hands washed clean. He could have had his heart washed clean had only he come to Christ that morning. But instead, like so many people today, he clung to his power, his position, and his prestige. He focused on the temporal. He forgot all about the eternal consequences. Evangelist James Robinson received a letter from a father in Arkansas following a crusade that he had just held. In the letter, the father related how his daughter had started attending church at the age of six because the church had a bus that went right past the house. The girl begged her daddy every Sunday, Daddy, come with me to church. And Sunday after Sunday, he refused to go claiming he needed to make more money by working at the gas station on Sunday mornings. Year after year, the girl begged her daddy to go. Year after year, he refused to attend church. Finally, after several years, the little girl herself stopped attending church. The dad was happy because now his daughter wasn't hassling her and wasn't bothering him anymore. A few years later, the man received a phone call and was summoned to the school where the daughter attended. The daughter was now 12 years of age. She had been sitting in a car with several other students, sniffing aerosol spray from a bag for a temporary high. The high she received that day took her far higher than she ever wanted to go, for that was the day she died. The autopsy revealed that the young girl was pregnant. The final words of the father's letter were most disturbing. James, please tell fathers, do not live for material things while forgetting the eternal. Let's bow together. Like the bewildered pilot and the broken-hearted parent, it's possible that you too have been living for the temporal and you've lost sight of eternity of what counts forever. You know, that could change tonight. This could be your Good Friday, the evening when you have an opportunity to do what Pilate and that parent did not do. And that is to declare Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. To know for certain that your sins have been washed clean by the Savior's blood. And to know that when you die, you'll spend eternity with him and all the believers in a wonderful paradise place that we call heaven. That is based on decision that you must make in your heart tonight. And so if you'd like me to pray for you, I would pray with you a short prayer that could bring you right to the king of glory, right to the gates of heaven. A prayer that would reassure you from here on out that you're a son or daughter of the king of kings. So if it's your desire to pray with me and give your life fully to Christ tonight, then I'd ask you to simply slip up your hand and I would love to pray with you this evening. You could do that right now.
Father, tonight a number of people have prayed. They have raised their hands, signifying their desire to release everything to you. And so for each of you, I'd like you to pray in your hearts this prayer that I offer to the Father tonight. Dear Father in heaven, I know that I've made many mistakes. Like the fella driving the truck, I've spilled the sauce all over the freeway. Like Pilate, I wanted to do well, but I made a major blunder of things. And like the Father, I put off making the decisions that would count for eternity. But regardless of all my sins, tonight you will give me a complete cleansing. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that was freely shed to wash away all my impurities. I embrace him as my Savior. I will live for him from this day on. He will be my Lord. And I will love him forever and ever. Thank you for your forgiveness. I will declare it to people I talk to and I will celebrate the freedom that I have in Christ come Easter resurrection morning. I pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sinners For every curse is blood a tongue One final breath and it was finished But not the end For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roared Oh, hail King Jesus
Let us be away 